Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Broadcast. We hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. We are pleased to have Dr. Thomas Brown and Ryan Kennedy here to talk about ADHD and bipolar disorder and the differences between the two. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, mode, excuse me, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 347 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. And finally, if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. Now for today's topic, is it bipolar disorder or ADHD moodiness? A guide to getting the right diagnosis and treatment. Many children, teens and adults diagnosed with ADHD experience persistent moodiness, outsized frustrations with daily life, protracted sadness, and or irritability over seemingly minor disappointments. It's often unclear whether such emotionality is part of a patient's personality or current developmental stage, an aspect of their ADHD, a reaction to medication, or a sign of a more serious mood problem like bipolar disorder. When excessive moodiness is persistent and problematic in someone with ADHD, it may be best to talk with your clinician to consider possible causes and treatment options. It is very important to differentiate moodiness associated with ADHD from that of bipolar disorder. Dr. Thomas Brown and Ryan Kennedy will talk about that today. Tom Brown is a clinical psychologist who earned his PhD at Yale University and served on the clinical faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine for 21 years, while operating a clinic in Connecticut for children and adults with ADHD and related problems. These days, he sees patients and directs the Brown Clinic for Attention and Related Disorders in Manhattan Beach, California. Dr. Brown's most recent books are Smart But Stuck, Emotions in Teens and Adults with ADHD, and Outside the Box, Rethinking ADD, ADHD in Children and Adults, A Practical Guide. He will have an upcoming book sometime in July or a little later in the year or the summer on Asperger's and ADHD. Ryan Kennedy is a nurse practitioner who earned his Doctor of Nursing practice at Quinnipiac University. For nine years, he has collaborated with Dr. Brown for research, publications, and in clinical practice. He is Assistant Director of the Brown Clinic for Attention and Related Disorders, where he specializes in assessment, behavioral, and psychopharmacological treatments for children and adults. You can ask questions during uh, Ryan's and Dr. Brown's presentation, and we'll get to as many of them as possible after they finish. So with all that being said, I'll turn it over to Tom and Ryan. Thanks so much for being here today, guys. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks We're us. delighted to be here. Uh, I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to take an overview on this issue about moodiness. I think it's a really important talk, topic to talk about. Uh, strangely, uh, the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for ADHD don't include any symptoms related to emotions. But the fact is it does include a statement that associated features of ADHD include low frustration tolerance, irritability, or mood lability. Now, there are many of us uh, researchers and clinicians who believe that problems with emotions really ought to be considered part of ADHD. And the fact is that most of the rating scales for ADHD do, in fact, include items in their 
uh, descriptions of ADHD. So we're going to try and talk today about uh, how these issues of moodiness show up in ADHD and also in a number of other related disorders. One of the uh, more common things we'll hear for those with ADHD is they feel easily frustrated. Uh, for example, uh, we had a patient who said, you know, he's sitting at lunch and there's this guy behind him who's eating at his sandwich going chomp, chomp, chomp. And he felt like getting up, closing his fist and whacking this guy in the mouth. For other people, this may feel like on a scale of zero to 10, like a two or a three. But for him, it's something really intense. It hits him like 10 or 11. These sort of things happen a lot with kids and adults. And these things sometimes show up at home, school, or both. Uh, usually adults and kids, they can manage to hold the uh, emotions together when they're at school or at home uh, because of social pressures and then, you know, uh, uh, react, you know, when they get home. But they feel these things very intensely, but they're over pretty quickly. For others, they feel the sense of being really easily irritated. Or they can be really quick to anger. And it feels like a computer virus is taking over their brain. They may lash out with a temper outburst and feel uh, really irritable enough to get verbal, or sometimes it's more passive aggressive. And usually later they'll feel a bit, you know, upset about what they did, but they um, have a hard time in the moment realizing that they're hurting others. As we take a look at, at this moodiness, you can realize that, that it comes in several different levels of severity. Now, there, there's some people with ADHD who don't get very irritable very often at all. But the fact is a lot have pretty chronic irritability, short fuse stuff. Uh, but the thing which I'd like to mention right now before we get into talking about the bipolar disorder is that having ADD does, or ADHD, I use those two terms interchangeably, does not increase the risk of bipolar disorder. Another category that many parents of kids with ADHD are quite familiar with is oppositional defiant disorder. These are the, the kids that uh, I often refer to as living with their middle fingers up. Uh, that often, regardless of what it is you're asking of them, they're going to find a, a reason to uh, to say, no, they're not going to do it right now or just ignore it. We'll be talking a little more about you know, soon about disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. That's a relatively new diagnostic category uh, that's to be used not with kids under six or after 18, because after 18, we'd be talking bipolar. But it, it's a way of saying there are some people who have big mood problems that are not quite bipolar, but it's moving in that direction. And then we also have, as you probably know, the distinction between bipolar one and bipolar two. And we're gonna be talking about uh, you know, the differences between them uh, in, in a minute. But let me mention before we even get to that, that bipolar one is the one that tends to be most serious. And one indicator of that is that the suicide rates for people with bipolar one is 15 times higher than it is in the general population. Now that does not mean that everybody with bipolar one is suicidal, but what it means is it's a more intense experience that sometimes leads to uh, you know, self injurious or destructive behavior. Bipolar two, interestingly enough, is not uh, less severe, and it's not more severe, it's less severe. Uh, but they still have many of the features of mania and with it depression. And those are things that we're going to be talking more about uh, as we go on. One of the most common uh, comorbidities we'll see with ADHD is oppositional defiant disorder. And this is... A, uh, a disruptive behavior that usually starts around the age of 12. Can uh, uh, start before that, but usually it's something that won't last more than six years and a lot of kids grow out of it. Uh, this is something that can be from 35 up to half of our patients with ADHD. But these kids, they have a debilitating sense of justice and they can be quick and impulsive or sullen with their their oppositional behaviors, but it's towards 
authority figures in their life. This could be parents or teachers, coaches, usually, you know, adults that are uh, telling them, hey, hey, you got to go and do this thing. And they have this, you know, sense of I'm not going to do that. You're not going to tell me what to do. Most of these kids, they grow out of it. But there's a few kids uh, where this gets worse and this becomes conduct disorder. And this is more delinquent stuff with uh, physical aggression, sometimes towards uh, other kids or pets, where they can get quite violent, uh, or sometimes it involves theft uh, and uh, destruction of property. As I mentioned before, disruptive mood regulation disorder, dysregulation disorder is a, a relatively new diagnostic category. And it's one that's to talk about pretty severe and recurrent temper outbursts. They can be behavioral, they can also be uh, uh, just verbal. But the fact is they're intense and the duration of them is usually grossly out of proportion to what you'd expect for whatever that particular frustration is. Uh, and it's got to be more than what you'd expect for a kid of that particular age. You know, and so uh, you, you, you're looking at something that, that is not appropriate for toddlers. You know, some of them are a little more moody and, and uh, disruptive than others. But the fact is, uh, these are kids where it seems to be a pretty established pattern. And these big outbursts tend to average at least a few times a week or more. And but the other thing is that the time in between is not all that mellow, that uh, often those people who get this diagnosis are people who are having a uh, pretty irritable mood and just sort of angry most of the day that seems to be going on for a good part of most days for them. And, it, and to make the diagnosis, the clinician would need to see that these are symptoms that have been present for a year or more. And that also that there hasn't been a period of even just a, a two or three months where you're not seeing some of it. So it's a pretty steady, persistent problem with mood dysregulation. With our uh, first case, uh, our patient we had, uh, we're calling Ricky. He was a really bright 12 year old boy in sixth grade, and his mother had described him as a a 12-year-old boy who tantrums like he's a five-year-old, and he had been this way since he was a toddler. His mother said that she, you know, she really uh, saw him happy, and some people would describe him as a grumpy old man. He smiles and laughs like every once every three weeks, she says, or if we're out doing something we really enjoy, like if you know they're going, uh, he was going skateboarding with his buddies. But for everything else that you know his parents would ask him to do. You know, he'll do it, but he'll start pouting like his younger sister or complain a lot or just, you know, seem irritated the whole time he's out with the family. His parents had him evaluated prior to seeing us um, at starting at the age of six. And he had seen several therapists, psychiatrists who thought he may have had bipolar disorder because of his uh, paternal family history. His uh, father, you know, didn't have a diagnosis, but always kind of felt, you know, chronically irritable. Uh, but it was his grandfather who was actually diagnosed with bipolar type 1, the very severe type, and was actually taking uh, lithium treatment and uh, responding quite well. Uh, and in the past, uh, before I was able to treat Ricky, you know, he was six, seven years old and he was treated with Vyvanse and Adderall. But uh, his parents said he had a really bad reaction to it. And that's when they saw us for a second opinion a few years after. But he, he, uh, Definitely had ADHD, and uh, the other diagnosis was the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and some features of Asperger's. But we had uh, several family therapy sessions, and he responded quite well to a combination of uh, long acting methylphenidate and uh, lomphacine extended release. And we did add in the uh, long acting lamotrigine as well for his mood, uh, and doing quite well today. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about bipolar one. Uh, this is something where we don't usually make the diagnosis until uh, sometime around 18 uh, or later uh, in terms of when the first episode occurs that would warrant that diagnosis. But the thing to keep in mind is that that if it's, if it's really bipolar one, chances are you're not going to be looking at just one episode in a lifetime. 
Uh, but let me mention that, that when we're talking about it, it's not all the same thing. You know, the, the main thing that the bipolar diagnosis is talking about is for bipolar one is a distinct period that there's a time where the person is having something that's not regular for them. Uh, but for the, for a short period of time, and it may be for a, a day or, or a, a week, uh, but most of the day, when they have either elevated mood, where they're just sort of revved up and, and uh, you know, have a difficult time slowing down. And then sometimes it's not so elevated, it's just expansive. It's like, I'm on top of the world. I, anything I used to think of as a problem isn't a problem anymore, and I can deal with everything and anything much better. The fact is that's the third category that you see most often, and that is an irritable mood, where the person uh, it just is pretty persistently irritable. And the point here is that it's abnormally and abnormal for them, and persistently increased activity or energy that's going on at least for a week or so, and is present most of the day, almost every day. And there may be one, just one or, or more episodes. And it's severe enough that it's making a lot of trouble for them in their social interactions or in their work situation uh, or in their schooling. And in many cases, bipolar one warrants a psychiatric hospitalization. So we're talking about something that, that is really a significant change from the person's baseline over a relatively short period, but it's intense and it makes a lot of trouble. Now, sometimes it's accompanied by major depression. We'll talk about the depression related to this in a few minutes, but uh, the fact is the bipolar one is a description of somebody with these intense episodes, one or more, uh, that's made a lot of trouble, and the prognosis often is, is that you're going to see some more of it. Now, in order to talk about this as bipolar one, uh, what you need to have to make the diagnosis is uh, at least three of this list that you see. Inflated self-esteem or grandiosity where I'm smarter and I'm better or I'm stronger uh, than anybody else around me. And often a decreased need for sleep. It's not just that they have trouble getting to sleep, but they, they don't feel a need for it. And that, uh, you know, they may uh, be rested for, uh, you know, sleep for just a few hours and they're up for the day and it doesn't look like they uh, are tired at all. With it comes a kind of pressured speech where they're talking so rapidly that it's like one word follows the other and it's often hard to follow them. And that's often reflecting something that's going on in their head. Uh, kind of racing thoughts where it's one thing and another thing and another thing and another thing. It's sort of flight of ideas. There's extreme distractibility, way more than you get just with, with ADHD. And, and this is the one, that, this next one is the one that's a little puzzling sometimes. Increase in agitation, rec, you know, restlessness. Uh, but sometimes there's a period of goal-directed activity. Let me give you an example. I had a college student one time who had a, a major episode of bipolar disorder and it was characterized by being up and getting almost no sleep for a period of, of four days, during which she wrote three extremely long and very good term papers. It's like she was just thrown into that and could not stop it. It just was going one right after the other, and she was a very bright student and did a, lot, did a very good job on each of them. Needless to say, she collapsed after that, but... Uh, and the other thing that you have to watch with, with bipolar one is that often there's an excessive involvement in, in things that are kind of risky. Now, sometimes it's, it's risk in terms of, of uh, buying. A lot of folks with, with bipolar one complain that sometimes they just get going with a credit card and they'll be spending money that it's almost like they never have to repay it. Um, Sometimes it's sexual indiscretions, getting involved in sexual activities uh, with people where it's a risky business for any one of a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's a time of, of jumping into business investments where you're tying up a lot of money uh, in ways that you wouldn't do at all if you, if you didn't have this sort of revved up hypermotor. 
And another thing that you often see with people with bipolar one is heavy drinking. And one of the, one of the reasons for that is that sometimes they use the, the heavy alcohol consumption in order to try to calm themselves down a bit. Now on this particular chart, uh, what it's showing you is that some of these characteristics, not all of them, but some of them that I've talked about, uh, which ones you, you are more likely to be present in ADHD and which ones are more typically characteristic of, of, of bipolar disorder. And you can see irritability and rage. Yeah, you do see that in, in, uh, in some kids and some adults with ADHD, but those three plus marks are telling you it's much more common in bipolar disorder. Restlessness, hyperactivity, yeah, that's typical. Usually the, it's the younger kids with, with ADHD where you see that, uh, but some adults. Bipolar, uh, that revved up quality is very much present. The inattention thing, yes, uh, both for ADHD, that's a central symptom, and in bipolar. But often with bipolar, you're also going to see some uh, some depressive episodes. Not always, but often. And it's just, but you also see them sometimes in ADHD. Substance abuse, you know, the risk of substance abuse for somebody with ADHD that's not treated is double what it would be for somebody else of the same age who didn't have ADHD. Uh, but in bipolar, it's very common. And then psychosis is not a symptom of ADHD where you, you really have a thought disorder. You get kind of nuts. Um, but uh, bipolar, not everybody with bipolar has psychotic symptoms, but it's not unusual. So these are uh, illustration, the, uh, the differences between these things, but also obviously you can see the overlap. And for, uh, for those with bipolar type two, uh, this is uh, less severe. And so you're gonna see these heightened uh, moods or uh, more expansive type of hypomanic behaviors for at least four days in a week. And of those days, uh, they're having at least three or more of those symptoms we had discussed in two previous slides. But for these people uh, with bipolar type two, uh, they're not going to display any psychotic symptoms and usually are not going to warrant any hospitalization for treatment. They're usually uh, some, uh, receive you know, pretty good treatment outpatient. And uh, what a lot of these people have in their past is a history of uh, a, mood, a mood episode, usually a ma uh, major depression. And sometimes this disorder can be tricky to diagnose and is something that you can find over time with people. And sometimes with the, the treatments for them, uh, they rather not uh, do this sort of treatments you see with bipolar type one, because some people with bipolar type two can use this, um, the energy that they have in those four days to be very productive and do some, you know, very creative, good work. So it's, it's something to uh, really, have a good conversation with them about if when they recognize the signs, sometimes the irritability comes before the hypomanic episode begins. Uh, and for those who have had major depression, uh, this is, you know, in the past two weeks, they'll feel like a very depressed mood mostly every day and just feel like they'd rather not be alive. Um, not all of them have a plan to to hurt themselves or to commit suicide, but they may be ruminating on that. This is not this, the sort of depression that comes with grief, where you have uh, the reminders of some feeling of emptiness and loss. This is much more different. This is ruminating and being pessimistic about, you know, everything sucks, everything will suck, and you continue to suck, and you have hard time getting any of the energy to muster up to do stuff that you used to enjoy. And people usually have a hard time concentrating and thinking, and that has a little bit of the overlap with ADHD, but it's a quite noticeable, uh, very low mood, and it affects their sleep and appetite, usually to the extremes. And to uh, wrap up, sorry, you go back a slide. 
Okay. Okay, I'd like to talk for a minute about bipolar disorder in kids. Now, one thing that's been a little controversial in the research on this is the question of do kids have to have a specific episode uh, in order to be uh, seen as having bipolar disorder? And the fact is, often with kids, you see these severe mood problems, and they're not clearly defined episodes. They're more, they, they just pop up here and there. Uh, and the other thing, that it's, it's complicated because about 80% of uh, kids and teenagers with bipolar disorder also have ADHD. They've also got oppositional defiant disorder and or uh, some major depressive disorder. It's often very difficult to tell whether a child or a teenager with ADHD and serious mood problems has severe ADHD, bipolar disorder, or both. Now, one of the things that sometimes helps us on this is what you see on the bottom bullet there. Both ADHD and bipolar are highly familiar. It means that it runs in families. And we know, for example, that for ADHD, the, uh, you know, the heritability index, and that could be a number anywhere between zero and one, uh, is about 0.76. And that means that a very large percentage of people who have ADHD are going to have at least a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a brother or sister who has it. Bipolar disorder is also highly heritable. Now, having one does not necessarily mean you have the other, but often you can see the overlap. That's 0.6 up to 0.85. So the point here is that these are problems that are often running in families. It doesn't hit every gener everybody in a generation. It doesn't hit all family members. But if you've got ADHD, out of every four people diagnosed with ADHD, one of them's got a mom or dad who's got it, whether they know it or not. And the other three, if they don't have a parent, usually they've got a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, or a cousin, or brother, or sister. You've got an even greater likelihood that somebody else in the family has serious mood problems if you're looking at bipolar disorder. So in, in uh, this next case example, I'm going to talk about uh, Jessica. So when I, I met her, she was in her early 40s, and uh, the, I just describe her how she um, described herself in our evaluation was that she was a curious and wildly energetic young girl who had all the classic ADHD symptoms. Uh, according to her mom, she said that she was an awful student and had, and still to this day, had a scatterbrained teenager. She was seen like a scatterbrained teenager in an adult's body. Um, however, her mom said that uh, Jessica has always been loved by every single one of her teachers, her friends, and anyone else who just got to know her for five minutes. She uh, barely finished high school and had a 2.3 GPA and managed to finish her degree in college after about five years. And when I met her, you know, she was happily married. She had two twin boys and she was actually a top performing executive and had an excellent career. And despite her success, she always felt like she was a black sheep. And she had, you know, uh, her parents and aunts and uncles who were successful doctors and lawyers. And she had uh, struggled with major depression on and off since high school. And uh, she had to seek counseling a few times for feeling out of control for short periods of time. But she admits that uh, she admitted to me that, you know, sometimes she felt like a rush while shopping and had, uh, you know, sometimes it'd be spending thousands of dollars on things that she really didn't need and regret that later or this, you know, um, habit she had for a little while of stealing small items. She's in that moment felt this uh, very intense rush of inexpensive things. And it was just because it was exciting at the time. And as I got to know her, it was pretty clear that she had ADHD and uh, bipolar type two that kind of waxed and waned. And when I had seen her at the time, she was on five hands twice a day. So we had uh, switched to a different long acting amphetamine uh but first, uh, before starting that, we had uh, used a, a long-acting uh, 
mood stabilizer with an SSRI. And she responded quite well to that, but her ADHD was still not managed uh, well. So we, that's when we added in the, the stimulant. And she, with that combination, she worked quite well. As we're talking about this, I think it's important to recognize that for many people who have these more severe mood problems, medication is a very important part of the treatment. However, I think we it's also really important to keep in mind medication alone is not usually enough in itself. Generally, the patient and the family really need some support to understand what they're dealing with. For example, to identify what are the triggers that tend to start off episodes where the whole family gets involved in, in the intensity of, of the mood disruption. What are some strategies that can be used to try and avoid getting into those worsening episodes? What do we know about the history of mood problems in the family? And then also to talk about both the uses and the limitations of, of the medicines that we have available. So we want to take a look at the, the therapeutic, family therapy or individual therapy or both, to try to help provide support for this, particularly around the time when you're first beginning to recognize it. But let me mention a few things about the stimulant medicines. The medicines that we often use uh, for ADHD uh, uh, don't have on their list of, of uh, functions that they improve moodiness, but often they do. They've certainly been demonstrated. I'm talking now about methylphenidate and the amphetamines that you're, most of you are pretty familiar with. Uh, I just want to say a few words about that. They've we've got clear research demonstration uh, you know, of the effectiveness and the safety of these medicines. There's been more research on the safety and effectiveness of the stimulant medicines than on any other medicines you're ever going to take, uh, especially because we use them with kids. But the thing that a lot of uh, people and a lot of prescribers even don't recognize is that the effective dose of stimulant does not know by how old you are, how much you weigh, or how severe your symptoms are. It goes by how sensitive is your body chemistry to this particular medicine. And so that's why it's really important to monitor uh, and fine-tune the dosing because the fact is there's a lot of individual differences, even within the same family sometimes, about how sensitive they are to this medicine. And also to think about, are you going to get coverage for the times of day when you really need it and to avoid being covered with the medicine in a way that's going to disrupt your appetite at critical meal times or disrupt your, your ability to get to sleep and stay asleep at night. All right. So uh, next, uh, for treatment of moodiness with ADHD, if uh, this is a patient without bipolar, then we, usually uh, stimulants are the uh, first line, and they're effective for about eight to nine out of ten people. However, if this is somebody who may or may not uh, who may have uh, bipolar disorder one or two, then we want to pay uh, careful attention to their mood and not uh, creating a, pr a problem by first not treating their mood. If uh, they have a higher level of irritability or agitation on stimulants, sometimes that is a sign. And we instead start, like I did in the second case example, with a mood stabilizer. Uh, and sometimes guanfacine extended release can be helpful too in reducing some of those impulsive uh, emotions that cause frustration and irritability and anger. Uh, and although uh, guanfacine is not a, a, a stimulant, it's a non-stimulant, it can be quite helpful for kids and uh, sometimes adults off-label, but uh, this is a, a dose that uh, starts small at uh, one if you're under 150 pounds and uh, goes up to four. Sometimes you can push it up a little bit, but it's something you really want to do carefully and not increase it too fast because sometimes you can People get dizzy or they stand up too fast. Uh, they get a rush to their head. But it can be quite helpful in reducing some of those impulsive emotions that a lot of people with ADHD and bipolar disorder have. 
What you see now in this diagram is something that it's really important for anybody who's taking stimulant medications for ADHD and or anything else uh, to be aware of, and that is the problem of rebound. If you take a look at the diagram here, you can see we're representing that here's the point of taking the medicine. It takes a while for them to kick in. Some of the short acting is about a half hour. Some of the longer acting is about an hour and a half. And then whatever the duration is, some of the medicines will last for four or five hours, some six, seven, eight, once in a while, 10 or 12. But if during this time when you'd expect the medicine to be working, the person is feeling too wired, like they've had way too many cups of coffee and they're kind of jittery. Or if they get really crabby, and irritable in a way that they don't usually act. Or if they get too serious or they sort of lose their sparkle. And, you know, they, they just don't act like their regular self. They don't feel much like talking with other people. Any of these things coming at this period when it's supposed to, the medicine's supposed to be working, chances are that the dose is too high for that person. Or it may just not be the right medicine. Now, keep in mind, this line could be longer or shorter, depending on which version you are. But these are the three things to look for. Feeling too wired or too racy, too crabby or way too serious and like you just don't want to interact with anybody. However, if you're not having any of that problem during the time the medicine is supposed to be active, but you do start getting it at the time when the medicine is supposed to be wearing off, that's a completely different problem. If any of these three things are happening for the first time of that day, during the time the medicine is supposed to be wearing off, chances are that it's a rebound. And what that means is it's dropping too fast. And it's usually pretty easy to fix, where you give a small dose of the short-acting version of the medicine so you can expand the exit ramp and be able to get rid of those things. So it's very important if a person's taking stimulants and they're having any of these difficulties, too wired, too crabby, or too serious, take a look at when it's happening and then talk with your clinician about it if it looks like it's something that's happening during the time it's supposed to be working. Chances are dose is too high. It's not a good medicine for the person. But if it's happening not during that time, but at the time when it's supposed to be wearing off, chances are you're looking at a rebound. Okay. I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this. We have enough time for questions. But this sort of reiterates, the slide reiterates a couple of the case examples with uh, the overlap with ADHD and bipolar. And usually the, the order of treatment uh, is going to be stabilizing the mood first. And that could be done with uh, one of the medicines on the list here. Uh, Lamictal extended release is, pr is pretty common, and as well as uh, aripiprazole for their, um, uh, they have less side effects usually than the others listed. But uh, at, sometimes adding in a stimulant is the second choice. And uh, a lot of prescribers are nervous about adding in SSRIs because sometimes by themselves they can increase the risk of a hypomanic or manic episode for bipolar disorder. But it's something that is helpful when the, someone's mood is not fluctuating so much, but they're really feeling quite down and depressed. And the SSRIs can help um, bring their mood up to baseline, but something you want to monitor carefully, especially in the first couple of weeks of starting the treatment usually with something like fluoxetine. And uh, an important thing to consider with pa uh, patients with ADHD and moodiness is the parent temper as well. Sometimes we'll have patients where their parents will say, you know, I, I struggle with some of these things too. And we had a good example of uh, a uh, mother who said, you know, my I hate Wednesdays. My husband... Uh, expects our boys to bring the trash cans up. And sometimes they do, but if my husband's having a bad day and he doesn't see those trash cans back in the house at the end of the day, he will get in their faces, get very angry very quickly and say things that he really regrets later. And uh, in that moment, he really has a hard time adjusting and remembering that he loves these kids and he would do anything for them. And so uh, in our uh, family uh, sessions, it's important to address both the uh, our patients and their parents, just so everyone's on the same page with how they're interacting with each other. 
Another thing that we see in dealing with parents who are struggling, because it is a struggle often to deal with a kid who's particularly irritable or with somebody who has ADD and on top of that has bipolar disorder. Uh, but one of the things that happens often is you get polarization between the parents, where you get one parent who says, we've got to track down, crack down on this kid so he can learn how to act. Otherwise, it's not going to work out for him over the long haul. And often the other parent will be saying, you know, we need to be patient. This kid is in trouble so much in school and, and dealing with other people. Uh, we should be supportive. He's always being confronted with what's wrong with him. And then what happens is that often each parent takes a more extreme, more polar position to fight for what they see as right for their kid. And it's hard for them to see that there's a sense in which both of them may be right, depending on the situation, and that they have to put their heads together in order to be able to know when to crack down and be more, more strict and when to be more understanding and supportive. Now, we don't have enough time to talk about all the different situations about this, but I did want to suggest to you uh, these readings uh, where you can get some idea. Ross Green's not particularly talking about bipolar, but he talks about explosive kids. Kate Jameson, a psychiatrist who has des described very articulately her own struggle with the ups and downs of bipolar. Steve Hinshaw, who talks about the impact of his father's bipolar disorder, and then Tim Willens and uh, uh, Hammerness have uh, got now the fourth edition of their book on medications, which talk about medications for these mood disorders and a variety of other things as well. And these are the books that I've published, and uh, this one has the, uh, quite a bit of information about emotions and mood, as does Smart But Stuck. And then this is just a preview of the new book that will be coming out later this spring. Okay, we're waiting for questions now. Okay, that was excellent. Very insightful. Um, a lot of people asking, does bipolar present differently in boys versus girls? Or in adolescents yeah. versus younger kids? Well, yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, the the older kids are more likely to uh, to be more articulate and more forceful uh, in their, uh, you know, expression of their frustrations and their anger, their irritability. Um, and, but the fact is, there's not a trophy that goes just to boys or to girls in terms of the intensity of it. There are some girls who have very intense episodes. And some guys, who boys who have uh, much less intense, uh, it's not specific to gender. When you see that mood irritability and the kind of, of manic or even the hypomanic, which is just slightly less intense, um, that, can, that can be found in boys or in girls, men or women. Mm -hmm. Could you just give a, a, a description of mania? Mania is, is a term that's used to, uh, it, 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 in the, the original meaning of the word, has to do with it being manic, being crazy. Uh, but the, it, it's referred to as to being way too revved up uh, and typically irritable, but not always. As I said, sometimes it's expansive and feeling like you're on top of the world. But the thing which is noticeable about it is there's a lot of oomph behind it in terms of the intensity of the emotion. Uh, which can be very persistent over days or sometimes weeks, depending on the nature of it. And then hypomania is the term for that sort of exaggerated intensity, which is not nearly as uh, as maxed out as you see in full-blown mania. Mm -hmm. Are there any screeners or diagnostic tools that you use to distinguish between ADHD and bipolar disorder? We've got tools that, uh, diagnostic tools that we use for uh, being able to identify ADHD, uh, but the, uh, the re recognition of bipolar disorder, uh, there's not one rating scale that we use. What we do mainly is to take a very careful history of what the episodes look like. And to hear about it, because sometimes what you get is is a lot of frustration that's coming in from parents who are describing how difficult their kid is to deal with 
uh, in some of these uh, more intense mood outbursts. But you need to get some feel for, okay, what set it off? How long does it last? What, you know, what's the intensity and persistence of it over time? And how long does it go on? So it, it's not like there's just one list that you do check off. It's asking for the details and him spending some time in clinical interview, trying to get a clearer picture of under what circumstances this occurs, how persistent is it, how much variability is there in the intensity of it, uh, because you'll find that some people come in and making it sound as though things are way out of control, when in fact most people would say, well, that's not so bad. Uh, but then there are other things where you need to, particularly when uh, they're doing things that endanger themselves or likely hurt them either physically or in terms of uh, the consequences with other people. Uh, those are things that a good clinician needs to do inquiry about and not just do a checklist. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do, it's pretty common to use the, like the PHQ-9 or uh, a newer ver a version for bipolar mood disorder is the ARE DOC mood rating scale or mood disorder uh, questionnaire. Those are uh, excellent clinical tools that you can use uh, in, in, in outpatient office to, you know, separate, you know, what's hypomanic, what's uh, type one versus, you know, moodiness and ADHD or with major depression. Uh-huh. Can you mention those two again? Uh, just yes. so people, yeah. The uh, first one I mentioned is the PHQ-9. Mm -hmm. And the second one was the A-R-E-D-O-C, a uh, mood rating scale. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, several people have asked, can ADHD meds actually cause temporary mania, thus confusing uh, or blurring the lines between bipolar and ADHD. Once in a while, you'll you'll have some people whose moodiness can get jacked up uh, by stimulant medication. Sometimes it's because the dose is too high, and it needs to be backed down a bit, and uh, then will work well for the ADD piece of it. But uh, there was a long time when people were told, the clinicians were told, no, no, you don't give stimulants for people who are, have bipolar or any serious mood problems because it's going to just jack up the mania. And the fact is, the research that's been done on this suggests that that is not usually the case. If you watch the dosing and it's not pushed up too fast, and if you pay attention to what the moods are, there occasionally you'll run into some people where the stimulants are jacking up the mood, but it's far more often the case that the stimulants can help to manage the mood as mm -hmm. long as the dosing is, is fine tuned to that particular person. Mm -hmm. uh, fair number of questions about DMDD. Um, one mom asks if the time in between episodes does not have persistent irritability or anger, does this exclude the diagnosis of DMDD? Uh, I think the, the important thing is to, to not get too hung up on, on the details of it. The diagnosis is basically a, uh, was created basically to recognize that there are some kids uh, who have significant moodiness, uh, and it's, it's not just regular old ADHD moodiness, uh, but the fact is that uh, it's more intense, it needs more attention. These are more severe and more recurrent temper outbursts, verbal or sometimes behavioral, uh, where it's grossly out of proportion. And it's not what you would expect for somebody of that particular age. And so it's not so much that you have to count the days, but uh, the big, big thing is this seems to be a very stable part of the person's functioning that's very difficult for them and for everybody else to manage. Mm -hmm. So the fine tuning of, of uh, which diagnosis is going to be used depends in part on the setting. But the fact is that this is a way of saying, yes, there are some kids. And remember that this is, this is something which is, is intended to be not applied to you know, somebody before 10 years old. And, but where it's a very persistent problem with moodiness, and that's a situation where you need a clinician who's pretty familiar with this sort of thing to be able to help to make the distinctions and to think about treatment strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. 
Uh, what about so-called, I hadn't heard of this, mixed bipolar? Someone is asking about that. That's a term which was used for uh, uh, a mixed e episode is, is one where you're getting uh, both examples of the it's sort of rapid cycling is the other way that it's often talked about it. It's where a person has an episode where within a matter of a few days, uh, you're seeing both the intensity of the revved up and at the same time, or I mean, maybe not the same day, but uh, within this, the same uh, time frame generally over the course of a week or more. Uh, you're also seeing a fairly profound drop off into fairly depressive mode. And um, that's really puzzling and yeah. needs to be looked at carefully by somebody who's had some experience with it. But it's not, these do not always present where it's clearly uh, one way or the other. And particularly with bipolar two, you may, you can, may get recurrent episodes, and at one time it may be almost exclusively revved up manic stuff or hypomanic and then uh you know a day or two later you get the much more profound it's a it's basically it's an intense variability uh, mm -hmm. uh between the two types and it's often referred to as rapid cycling or just mixed type mm -hmm. uh one mom asks if there has been a single manic episode does the brain, so to speak, blaze the trail that makes it more likely for another episode in the future, suggesting the need for long-term antipsychotic medication to stabilize the mood? It's a good question. Those are not easy decisions to, to make. Go ahead, right. Ryan. Uh, uh, for many people, if they have one episode of, of uh, manic uh, bipolar disorder type one with a manic episode, they're likely to have an episode again. So it's in some way, it's not so much that it's, you know, sort of blazing the trail, but it's, uh, the you know, the first big episode and the others are likely to follow. And it's and no way of sort of predicting these sort of things when the next one's going to happen as if there's clear defined borders between the episodes. But uh, likely, if you do see one, they uh, reoccur. Yeah, but at the same time, you don't necessarily do use your heavy-duty medications on an ongoing basis if you're not right. seeing repeated episodes. Mm -hmm. Right. What are the main characteristics of moodiness attributed to ADHD versus something more like ODD or DMDD? I think it has mainly to do with the intensity and the degree to which it's is disruptive of the individual's functioning and their interactions with other people. Uh, and the fact is that there are some people who tend to be pretty irritable and pretty crabby most of the time, but they also have periods when they've got a sense of humor and when they are a little more mellow. And then there's some other people who uh, tend to be much more frequently overreacting to situations where small frustrations lead to big outbursts, and sometimes the big outbursts go on way longer than most people would expect them to. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that the severity could be in terms of how bad it gets during the time the episode's going on. If, for example, a person gets involved in, in heavy drinking, reckless driving, spending way too much money uh, on stuff they don't really want or need and can't afford. Um, or if they uh, are running around uh, flitting from one thing to another. You know, if you look at the, at the intensity, to what extent is it disrupting the person's functioning? And to what extent is it disrupting the functioning of the family or the classroom? Yeah, and uh, something that's uh, uh, helpful to do in these situations when I'm talking with families is to have them keep a diary at home and, you know, writing down, you know, day to day what sort of the general mood is. And if it, an issue does pop up, you know, what happened, what was happening before that, and, you know, some information about how they, what they did to sort of chill out or, uh, you know, how they sort of, coped with the situation and sort of having a diary like that can give you an idea of is this uh 
more of just the idea of some moodiness that happens with ADHD or something uh, else. Yeah, another thing that's important, too, is to recognize that how the family deals with it when an episode is going on can make a big difference. For example, there are some kids who, if they're agitated, uh, you know, want to get in an argument and would like to go on with that argument for a long, long time. And they're, uh, you know, and parents get involved and get locked into it. And there are other kids where they do much better if you can get them to go to their room and just stop talking mm-hmm. for a while. And then uh, you come back and address the issue later in a situation where everybody's more calm. Because I think it's important to take a look at the family system that's mm-hmm. going on uh, and to take account of that and see what things seem to work with this particular person in this particular family. Mm-hmm. Does therapy have a place uh, in helping as an effective treatment or part of a treatment plan for DMDD or bipolar, or is it all just medication? No, it's not all just medication. I think it's really important in situations like this uh, for the clinician to spend some time talking both with the identified patient, the person who's having the most trouble, and also with the family. Because each person then can offer a little bit of perspective on sort of how this is hitting them and their suggestions about things that might work. And it's uh, the, the mood disorders can be frightening to people. Right. When you, you know, sometimes they'll describe it as though it's like I feel like I'm possessed, that, that uh, I'm just not my regular self. I'm too revved up. I'm not able to settle down. Uh, and uh, and then also, particularly if, if, if they're uh, in one of those periods where they're just not getting much sleep, they don't seem to need it, but pretty soon they're going to wind down. So I think that, that talking with the patient, just handing the pills out is not going to do the job. It's yeah. important to get a picture of how the individual who's most directly involved in it and how the, the family members who are spending time with them and responding to it, uh, you know, everybody needs to have a little bit of help in terms of being able to uh, try to figure out ways of getting these uh, episodes to be less destructive and less intense. And also then to deal with the f- fact that people who have these episodes often get down on themselves. For example, they're, they're, many times they'll shoot their mouth off and say all kinds of things that come to mind in terms of how frustrated they are with somebody and, and how worthless uh, they feel these other members of the family are um, and will get revved up to the point where they're, they're talking in ways that later uh, you know, are you know they may be ready to put it behind them, but the people who are getting wounded by these verbal attacks are not. Right. right. Yeah. So I think it, it's important to help the family to cope with it, and also to try to take a look and see: Are there any things that other family members are doing that may trigger this kind of thing? Because it can get to be a, a family systems issue. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's important, I think, not to look just at meds and not to look just at the person who's the most outspoken, because sometimes there are other things going on in the interactions between the family members uh, that need to be addressed that might really make a difference in terms of being able to uh, to find a a more adequate way of of coping with the stresses within the family. One, I know we're just about through, but I just wanted to ask a question because so many people who are at various, you know, places in the country want to know how they can find a doctor uh, who can, you know, diagnose ADHD and bipolar. Are there any, um, I mean, do they just have to go through a directory or university hospitals, um, good sources of people who might specialize in this? Well, I don't. I don't know about directories, but uh, but what I what I do think is useful is to talk with the the primary care doc, a pediatrician, or whoever is the primary uh, care person uh, that they're dealing with, and to uh, ask for advice, because clinicians who've been working in the community probably usually will have some ideas about which doctors have been recognized as being helpful for some of these more complicated mm-hmm. things. There are some people who can handle regular old ADD and regular depression pretty well, and there are other people who had 
experience, and particularly in the hospitals, psychiatric hospital settings, uh, where they're much more skilled in dealing with the more complicated and more intense cases where you need to make greater use of, of more heavy-duty medications. But I think to, to search out the resources in your community through the professionals that you already have some contact with and ask them to help you. And if they themselves don't know, see if they can refer you to somebody else who might. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the hour is up. That was excellent. I loved your presentation. I'm sure the attendees did as well. And thank you again for being here and shedding so much light on this. This is a complicated topic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We've enjoyed doing it. And thanks to all of the attendees for joining us. And also make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, ADHD expert articles, or important research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thanks everyone for being here and have a great day. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.